welcome to the worship service of Talbot Cumberland Presbyterian Church. On this third Sunday of Advent, we light the pink candle on the Advent wreath, the candle of joy. We celebrate the joy that Mary experienced as she heard news of a baby, a baby that would come to her supernaturally, who would be the Messiah. Today, we will reflect on the Magnificat. It's the joyful poem that Mary sang. Magnificat in Latin means, my soul magnifies the Lord. Mary sang this song as she met her cousin Elizabeth. She rejoiced after hearing news that she would birth the Son of God. In worship, we consider Mary's joy. Light the advent candle three, Isaiah 55, 12, the prophet writing 700 years before the birth of Christ says this, you will live in joy and peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into song and the trees of the field will clap their hands. Good Christian friends rejoice with heart and soul. Good Christian friends rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now you hear the death we say, news, news, Jesus Christ is born today. He has opened heaven's door and we are blessed forevermore. Christ is born today. Christ is born today. In the fall of 1995, I was working on a master's degree at the University of Northern Colorado. And not long into the semester, I began not feeling very well. I felt tired all of the time, and I lost my appetite, and I felt especially bad in the mornings. Now, Mark and I had been married for about three years, and we were thinking about having a baby, so one morning I headed over to the university clinic to see if they could give me a pregnancy test. Now, that was in the days when you couldn't just swing by the drugstore and pick one up from over the counter for a few bucks to find out for yourself if you were pregnant. So I headed over to the clinic and I took the test and I waited in the patient room waiting for results, not very patiently, and the more I waited, the more excited I got. I wonder if it could really be so. I remember the nurse came into the room holding my chart in her hand and looking down at it. She seemed tentative, not knowing how I would respond. It looked like she'd had a lot of experience in this. She said, well, we got the test back and it looks like you're pregnant. Wow, I jumped up from the chair and I gave her this big hug and she just stood there. <laughs> By the way she stood there, I don't think that she had experienced that before. So she gave me some pamphlets and told me to go and buy some vitamins and eat saltine crackers and she sent me on my way. I couldn't wait to tell Mark and everyone the good news. Mary expressed a similar enthusiasm in her joyful song. The Magnificat is filled with joy. In a few minutes, we'll talk about this song of Mary. But you know, Jesus' birth story doesn't begin there. It begins with the Annunciation. It begins with the angel Gabriel visiting Mary. And it's a story that began with fear. The first chapter of Luke tells us, the angel said, 
Don't be frightened, Mary. Mary was a poor young woman, a nobody, but she suddenly found herself in the presence of the supernatural. Over the ages, many people have reflected on this encounter. And in the town of Nazareth, there are several cathedrals, each dedicated to this encounter between Mary and the angel Gabriel. Mark and I had the opportunity to visit these sites when we visited Israel. The two most renowned and most visited sites are the Greek Orthodox Church and the Basilica of the Annunciation. At the Greek Orthodox Church, below the ground level, there runs a small freshwater spring. Tradition says that Mary drew water daily there for her family. Often nowadays, people will throw coins in the well. The other church, a Catholic church, is the Basilica of the Annunciation. On its upper level, artists from around the world were commissioned to make images of the Annunciation. They used different mediums, wood, mosaics, paint. From Venezuela to Ireland to Canada, Poland, Malaysia, the United States, Japan, Ukraine, and Slovenia, and Greece, they all capture the beauty of this wonderful encounter. Look how they depict Mary's joy. One fascinating thing about this place is to consider how the whole world has been affected by something that started in Nazareth, a tiny town, somewhat like White Pine, Tennessee. This encounter between an angel and a young woman happened in an insignificant place. And now, people from around the world visit this site on their own spiritual pilgrimage. They encounter God in new ways. And these people, they represent only a small portion of those believers whose lives have been changed by an encounter with God through Christ. And it started in a small moment. One sentence changed the course of history. Don't be frightened, Mary, for God has decided to bless you, the angel said. It was joyous news, but it was also concerning news. Why would God take notice of her? The angel continued, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby born to you will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What great news! Her people had been waiting for deliverance. They had been waiting for God's intervention. While the Hebrew people were in exile, the prophets foretold that there would be a Messiah one who would come and make all things right. The Hebrew people hoped for one who could help them to overthrow the Roman Empire, to possibly deliver them back to their promised land. Like the words of Psalm 110 says, The Lord says to my Lord, I will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. You will rule in the midst of your enemies. Reflecting on this psalm, they envisioned a powerful leader, they imagined a warrior who could set things right. But God chose to work a different angle, to disrupt the power structures, not by strength. The angel came to someone who was by outward appearances powerless, in a powerless position by gender and class and nationality. Her powerlessness seems to be a part and parcel of what God's message was, and that is why she was chosen by God. Of course, Mary had the power of choice of whether or not to cooperate, to accept the message or to reject it. Mary responded to the angel's message, let it be to me as you have spoken. Then she quickly traveled to visit her cousin to share the news. Elizabeth asked, how could this happen to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? It seems that when she heard Elizabeth's question, Mary was overtaken with joy. She breaks into song in what has been called the Magnificat. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. Mary is not just sharing her thoughts with her cousin. Her words reflect her humility. They reflect her faith in God as she echoes the words of the scriptures. For the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name. His mercy 
is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm, she says. She recognizes the attributes of God, holiness, mercy, strength, and then she sings about God's actions in the world. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Mary's life was turned upside down by the angel Gabriel. She knew that God would in turn turn the world upside down through this baby. I remember the first time I saw the world turned upside down. Well, a map of the countries of the world flipped, or as we would say, upside down. I was in downtown Knoxville in a little shop on Market Square, and this map, it captured my attention. I just stood there, staring at the map. It was very disorienting. It was difficult to find my country in it and in relation to the other countries where everything was. It occurred to me, of course, that as the world flows in space, there is no up or down side to it. What we think of as up or down is a construction of our own perspective. God was bringing a new perspective, one that would disorient. Mary understood that God would turn the world upside down, changing what it means to be a believer and a follower of God. Mary joyfully sang about this upside down world, a world where the proud were scattered, the weak were made strong, and the hungry satisfied. She recognized that God was doing a new work in her. Through her, the world would be turned upside down. Her words were a harbinger of things to come. It seemed that so many things were opposite of what they should have been. It was a disorienting beginning. This king was born in a cave and slept in a cattle trough, and then shepherds came to welcome him. That would be like the garbage collectors of our day coming. But everyone rejoiced. We see Jesus' birth story as one of joy, but think how it is filled with turmoil. Mary's fear when encountering the angel, her concerns about being abandoned by Joseph or shunned by her family, or maybe even stoned to death by her community, the dangers of traveling while pregnant, concerns about food along the way and safety on the road, the fears inherent with any pregnancy, including the dangers of childbirth. Yet, as we read the story, we focus on joy. Indeed, Mary focuses on joy. Her response to the events in her life models another path for us. During this Christmas season, our stories, like hers, are filled with turmoil. It's a different kind of a turmoil, but it's still turmoil nonetheless. We struggle with anxiety. We worry about the future. We wonder what will happen to us. Will we be caregivers or patients? We wonder what challenges might lie ahead or if our own lives will be in danger. In addition to mourning the loss of life, we mourn the loss of routines and the traditions that we love. We struggle with economic hardships and distance relationships. And yet, like Mary, we can choose joy. She chose joy in three ways. First, there is joy in knowing that we have God's favor. God takes notice of us. God chooses to partner with us to accomplish tasks in the world. As individuals and as the church together, we can recognize our worth in God's work of turning the world upside down. Individually, when we open ourselves to God without pride or, on the other hand, without self-deprecation, God can use us. God searches for humble people with willing hearts. We don't have to have everything right in our lives before we can be used by God. Have you ever been asked to do something that you thought was entirely out of your box, and once you accomplish it, you have this amazing feeling of joy? One summer at a denominational camp, I had an opportunity to learn to sail. I learned to sail on a small boat from the father of two youth in my youth group. The trick was my teacher, Vic, was blind. At the time, his kids didn't really enjoy sailing, so he asked me if I wanted to give it a try. I learned a lot that week, 
On this sailboat, occasionally I would point his arm in the direction in which we were headed, and he taught me how to feel the wind and understand how to use it to scoot along the water. For years following that experience, I dreamt of sailing. My openness to trying something new allowed me not only to help him, but to experience a deep sense of gratification and joy. It was certainly out of my box. It's a joy to open ourselves to new experiences as we allowed God to work in us and through us. As a church family, we celebrate as new members bravely step out and try new things, maybe teaching a Sunday school class or visiting someone or leading a group of children or youth, or stepping into a leadership role that they might not have considered. They might have no experience, but when asked, they open themselves to the opportunity. It can be a life changer for them and for the people that they touch. Like a 19-year-old who helped me to lead a week of kids camp. She later decided to become a teacher and over the years has impacted the lives of children in the Knoxville public school system. It's great to see her following her call. As a church, we continue to open ourselves to listening to God's voice, listening for God. Last spring in the children's ministry class I taught at Carson Newman, we talked a lot about how to encourage children to connect with God, to experience God. I invited Wynne McGregor, the writer of the Way of the Child curriculum, to come and to speak with our class about her innovative approach, which allows children, after hearing a Bible story, to quietly go to stations. And there, they reflect on what the story might be saying to them, how God might be speaking to them, as they journal or draw or do a finger labyrinth, read or pray, they allow room for God to speak to them. At the end of the session, when we would group up, their comments about their reflections were, were just as diverse as they are. It's as if each of them was God's favorite, which they are. And it's true for adults as well. As the church, we can provide opportunities for people to experience God and to know God's favor settings that allow space for God to work. What's amazing is that when you walk a labyrinth or you reflect on scripture and you journal about it, your heart is changed. I know, sometimes before I start, I feel like I'm sacrifice, sacrificing time out of my busy day. But by the time I finish, I notice that my priorities have shifted. I'll have a sense of calm. When we quiet ourselves, we often experience God's favor in our lives. Mary had such joy. She knew God's favor. She knew that God knew her and God had a special purpose for her. The same is true for us and for our church. The second way that Mary chose joy was by remembering God's faithfulness. After hearing the news, Mary went to share the good news with her cousin. She joyfully told of God's faithfulness. She celebrated with Elizabeth, whose baby leapt. Perhaps he too was jumping for joy inside of her. Perhaps it was a foreshadowing of his own call, his job of proclaiming God's faithfulness. How do we celebrate God's faithfulness? Sometimes we jump for joy, or we feel like it anyway, when we hear really great news. Often we share encouraging stories as we gather at the church. Stories of how after much prayer, something worked out that we were struggling with, or how with God's help, we got through a difficult situation. During the holiday season, we joyfully share the story of God's faithfulness. Now, usually we've enjoyed many gatherings here at the church, the hanging of the greens, where we set up the tree and put out all of the decorations, the stories and carol service, an evening of Christmas bells and gingerbread houses. We celebrate the Moravian love feast, and of course, we have the Christmas Eve candlelight service. We light on that evening the Christ candle and then we close the service by singing Silent Night. These joyful events reminded us of God's faithfulness in sending Jesus. But now our world has changed. Now we're challenged to think of new creative ways that we can retell the Christmas story. Fortunately, through technology, we can remain in contact this year, our Advent services and our Christmas Eve service are all on the internet as well as in person. We can continue to share the stories of God's faithfulness, 
just as Mary recognized God's faithfulness. A third way that Mary chose joy was through her belief that God would change the future. Her joy came from a belief in the goodness of God's future. Mary knew that God would do great things in the world. She could envision a world that looked very different from the one that she lived in, a future where love, mercy, and justice reigned. Jesus' message was very different than the message of the world. Joy in giving rather than receiving. Joy in serving rather than being served. When we're at our best, Christians convey these upside-down values. You know people like this. People like Hope Williams, who set up a community kitchen in Morristown to serve the hungry. You know, his joy in serving was contagious. People from all walks of life joined with him to raise funding, to locate a building, to fix up the kitchen, and dedicate time to regularly cook, serve, and clean up. So many people are involved in this ministry. I remember one Saturday, a mother brought her two boys to play cello and violin for people to enjoy as they ate their lunch. Hope's vision inspired others and brought out the best in them. His joy moved hearts. It's great to be around people like that. Generous people, people with integrity, people who would rather serve than to be served themselves. Wouldn't it be wonderful if people would feel joy when they encounter us or when they come to our church? Not that they have to break into song like Mary did. Life isn't a musical after all. But wouldn't it be something if our joy was contagious? One nonprofit group in New York City sets out to do just that. Public color transforms spaces that are sometimes very drab and they add color. They go to schools and you can see that from their before and after pictures what a difference it makes after they paint. Things change. People start to feel more joyful, more optimistic. They do better in their schoolwork. And in fact, attendance increases. You know we're all hardwired to feel joy when we see things like bubbles and sunsets and ice cream cones with sprinkles and fireworks. It turns out that pops of color and symmetrical shapes, round things, bright things, and things that are airy, they can really just lighten our mood. It's interesting that our holidays are filled with such shapes. When you see them, you feel a kind of lightness and joy in your heart. I wonder, how could we create positive, joyful spaces in our places of worship? Joy is a choice, even in a difficult time, even in times of pandemic and social distancing. We, like Mary, can choose joy. I'm sure you remember the devastating school shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School in 2012. It devastated the community and the nation, but the community chose to rebuild. They created an incredibly safe and protected new school, but it was built not only to safeguard the children, but to inspire joy. This is the entry to the school where color and design inspires hope and joy. In the lobby, 20-foot-tall aluminum trees create a protected but an inspiring space, filled with safeguards but also color and light. As individual believers and as a worshiping community, we too should choose joy and celebrate the blessings of life, even in difficult times. We are called to be a part of the story of joy about which the angels sang. Acts 17 tells us that one charge against the early Christians was, these people are turning the whole world upside down. Consider the possibility that maybe, just maybe, our world right side up may not be all that it could be. Joy can turn the world around.